everyone. Today we're going to be talking about using positionality statements and how we can use them as educators, as learners, and as researchers. My name is Dr. Lindsay Vreeland. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm an inclusive teaching coordinator at the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning at Northern Illinois University. If we're going to talk about positionality statements, I need to share my own. So again, my name is Lindsay. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a white cis woman. I'm also a stroke survivor, and I'm a first-generation college graduate with a PhD in English literature and a graduate certificate in women, gender, and sexuality studies. Currently, I'm an inclusive teaching coordinator at CIDL, but I've worked at, as a co-coordinator for NIU's Writers' Workshop, and I've taught composition, American literature, and gender and sexuality studies um, courses at the college level for over a decade. And that's been at online universities and person universities, um, community colleges, and I've taught uh, asynchronous, synchronous, face-to-face. -face. In the field of gender studies, my research focuses on the role that community plays in he creating healing spaces for gender-based trauma. In my role as an inclusive teaching coordinator for CIDL, my research focuses on creating inclusive environments for learners and educators. As a feminist scholar and educator, I recognize that academia and academic disciplines have been built on oppressive systems like white supremacy, patriarchy, and colonialism, and that those systems work uh, together and are intertwined. And while I may benefit from these systems, I want to learn from and center voices that are different than my own as an educator, researcher, and individual. One way to intentionally create space for different voices is to acknowledge our positionality. So positionality is just the way that we understand the world and approach research and acknowledging that that is based on our identities and experiences. So that might be our social identities, our culture, our upbringing, the trauma or oppression that we experience, our education level or type of education that we experience, even where we receive the education, what part of the world, what part of the country. Um, it could be our career. And we need to acknowledge that our identities and experiences intersect in interesting ways that uh, also create this positionality. And positionality is a way to acknowledge that there's not one normal, neutral way to approach any topic. Um, there's this myth of objectivity and that we can approach information in a, an objective, neutral way, but that's very much built off of this idea of uh, white, cis, heterosexual men having a lot of control in research and in education systems. And so their understanding of topics is very much uh, what we consider to be objective or neutral. Um, and so positionality is pushing against that and acknowledging our positionality is a way to acknowledge that that's not the only perspective that exists. Even if you are white, cis, and heterosexual man, um, there are other identities and experiences that you are bringing to the table that is going to influence the way that you approach certain topics. So everybody has positionality, um, even if you fall into a group that is considered to be quote unquote normal. One way to acknowledge that positionality is by using positionality statements. So uh, these statements are a way for us to claim and describe our positionality. We get to acknowledge our bias and our authority. And in this circumstance, bias is not a negative thing. It just means that we have uh, an established relationship with a particular topic or uh, text or research and we, we have uh, preconceived ideas about it or opinions about it or just awareness. 
Um, they also allow us to recognize the intersectional nature of experiences, identities, and knowledge that influence our opinions. And we can use positionality statements as an educator, as a scholar, or a learner. Um, and you might want to use them in your syllabus or in a website bio so that students know um, you as an educator or you as a researcher, where you're coming from, what your expertise are, um, why you're teaching a particular class or are um, participating in a particular field. It allows you to clarify your perspective as an outsider or an insider. So if you have lived experience with something, that's awesome. Um, if you're coming in to uh, a field or into uh, a class not having necessarily the identities that's going to be explored, that's okay. You can acknowledge that. Um, that doesn't mean that you don't belong in that space, but acknowledging it freely is, is a good idea. Um, you also get to identify your expertise, whether it's professional or lived. So again, you might be an outsider uh, with lived experience, but professionally you might be an insider. You might um, have a lot of experience studying that field or working closely with people uh, that are big in that field. And you also get to identify your, your privilege, um, which depending on the subject matter might be a big deal. There are a lot of great outcomes when educators, learners, and researchers use positionality statements. So we get to practice self-reflection. We get to create inclusive learning environments by acknowledging identities. That also allows us to value diverse perspectives and voices and demonstrate that identities matter and that it matters what you're bringing to the table as an individual. We get to recognize the value of lived experiences and how that influences the way that you look at, at topics, at texts, um, the way that you show up in the classroom. And you can also relate to others through shared experiences. So sometimes you'll mention something in a positionality statement where um, maybe it doesn't necessarily seem super relevant. Um, like my disclosing that I'm a stroke survivor might not seem super relevant in a composition class, but uh, it does allow students to relate to me that have had similar experiences and that also might influence the way that they are looking at a topic for research uh, for the class or the way that they might um, ask me questions or understand my individual needs or help me understand their needs as well. With the help of the Equity Institute and Queen's University Center for Teaching and Learning, we can break down positionality statements into uh, four steps of, of reflecting and writing. So um, the first step is to identify what social identities that you hold that are significant to your work. And the second step is essentially the same thing with experiences. What are the experiences that you've had that have shaped who you are, that have shaped how you um, enter a classroom, how you do your research, how you relate to other people in the field? You also want to consider how the field reinforces or ch challenges dominant narratives. Um, if there is uh, an understanding that people within your field are all within the same faith, that might be something that you would want to address. And you want to identify how the field impacts you and how you challenge the field and its practices. Again, if you're um, of a faith or don't have the faith um, at all that is related to your, your field of study, if uh, the field is dominantly um, cis white men and that's not uh, your identities, uh, if the field is prominently people who have uh, higher education um, from Ivy League schools, 
if you are, um, if you studied internationally, um, if, if English isn't your first language, if uh, Spanish isn't your first language, what are you bringing to the table as far as your identities um, and your experiences that either reinforce or challenge those dominant narratives? And how does that impact you and, um, and the field? And then you'll want to identify the values um, that you have and the goals of your work. So what are you specifically trying to do um, with your space within that field, with your space within that classroom, uh, with your space within that department? As I wrap up my video about positionality statements, I want to leave you with some thoughts. Um, some of you might already be disclosing aspects of your positionality and your identity with your students and colleagues and maybe aren't doing it in an intentional way through a positionality statement. Um, so are you already doing that? Um, do you think that positionality statements would actually influence your connection to others, whether it's students or colleagues whether it's colleagues within your department or within your university, um, within your research field. And would hearing about the identities and experiences of others impact your sense of belonging in the field, institution, or department that you are in? And if so, do you think that it would impact your students and your colleagues as well? Thanks so much for listening. Again, my name is Dr. Lindsay Breland. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm an inclusive teaching coordinator for the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning at Northern Illinois University. For those of you that are NIU staff and faculty, if you have any questions or concerns or would like help developing your own positionality statements or receiving other help with um, inclusive teaching practices, feel free to email me or call me and I will happily help you all. Thanks everyone.